Kaju is Vice President for Research and Economic Development and Director of the Center for Unified Biometrics and Sensors at the University of Buffalo in New York in the US. He's also a SUNY Distinguished Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and Director of National Science Foundation Center for Identification Technology Research in the US. His research areas of interest include AI, machine learning, pattern recognition, computer vision, and information retrieval with contributions to developing innovative solutions in areas such as document image analysis and biometrics. Dr. Govinda Raju has co-authored about 400 uh, refereed scientific papers and has been a principal or co-investigator of sponsored projects funded for about $65 million. As an established leader in the field, Dr. Govinda Raju has supervised the dissertations of 35 doctoral students and served on the editorial boards of premier journals such as the IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence and is currently the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Biometrics Council Compendium. I invite you, Dr. Vena Govindaraju, to deliver the third key note address for today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak uh, today. Uh, the, the title of my presentation is Artificial Intelligence in Education. I know there is quite a bit of apprehension with artificial intelligence today, with it being in the news for perhaps many wrong reasons. Uh, but we at University at Buffalo, we are committed to artificial intelligence for social good. Yeah, and education for all is the highest uh, social good. Uh, and that spans the divide, the digital divide, not just in terms of resources, but in terms of geography, language, and most importantly, the abilities of our students. So uh, just recently, uh, we uh, were awarded a National Science Foundation Institute grant for $20 million to set up this institute for exceptional education, uh, which essentially is education, special education, education for children with special needs. Uh, this is the highest award the National Science Foundation can make uh, in pretty much any area, and it's very prestigious. So uh, in the last couple of years, uh, about 25 institutes have been set up in the United States. Uh, five of them are in agricultural space and another five in the space of education. Uh, so University at Buffalo is leading the education institute for special needs children. Uh, you also have institutes at uh, Urbana-Champaign, Georgia Tech, uh, North Carolina uh, and, and uh, another university. So our institute uh, is essentially set up with nine different universities coming together with University at Buffalo leading this group, this consortium of universities. And so we have in our team from the West Coast, University of Washington, Stanford, uh, you know, we have La University of Las Vegas, uh, in, the, in the Midwest, Urbana-Champaign, and on the East Coast, Penn State, Cornell, uh, and Texas, El Paso, and South. So it covers, you know, the, pretty much the whole map of the U.S. And uh, we have experts in natural language processing, computer vision, robotics, uh, communicative disorders, learning sciences. So it's a truly interdisciplinary research team trying to address some of the pressing challenges that society faces today. 
So if you look at uh, the number of disabilities you know, children could have, uh, they have listed out about 13 uh, you know, different kinds of disabilities. And uh, we have decided to focus on the first, third, and fourth in that list, which is special learning disabilities, autism spectrum, and speech and language impairment. And uh, we will see how artificial intelligence can be actually used uh, to make sure that no child is left behind. So if you look at, uh, you know, dyslexia, for example, one of the special learning uh, disabilities, uh, it affects many children. Uh, you know, it can be seen, the symptoms can be seen in poor reading and writing. And uh, we believe that artificial intelligence can actually make a difference. Uh, so uh, approximately 15% of people in the U.S. have dyslexia. This uh, corresponds to about 30 million uh, adults, you know, in the United States. And uh, as you can see in the, in the view graph over there, uh, when writing, you know, dysgraphia, it's essentially when letters get misspelled by, you know, switching and reversing the order. Uh, so that's the first, uh, you know, disability that we'll be looking at. And when you talk about autism, you know, the symptoms uh, could be many. You know, it could be, you know, kids who feel, uh, want to stay isolated, don't want to join groups, they have sleeping problems, uh, they reject cuddling, uh, there is hyperactivity, uh, and so on. So there are many different systems where artificial intelligence can clearly play a role in both detecting and then providing with assistive tools so that they can overcome some of their disabilities. Uh, so here is an example, a good example, uh, where on the right side uh, you will see uh, 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 an example of how a kid could be asked to lean to the left or right to match, you know, uh, uh, the person's expressions. And, you know, these are some of the tools that we know we could be developing uh, using AI. Uh, so autism, again, you know, one in 36 children, which is about 3% of the population. We are looking at speech and language impairments, uh, you know, various kinds where AI can, you know, play a role. Uh, so some uh, staggering facts over here, five to 10% of Americans have communication disorders, which costs a whopping 150 to 180 billion annually. Uh, the first grade, uh, roughly 5% of the children have noticeable speech disorders. 3 million plus Americans stutter. 7% of Americans have some form of language impairment. Approximately 1 million Americans suffer from aphasia, which is essentially some kind of brain disorder which uh, affects their speech and language processing. So here is a view graph which tells you, if you look at this full spectrum of the 13 disabilities, a big chunk of that relates to speech and language. So here is the challenge for our institute. If you look at, you know, the places where speech and language is a major part of the disability, 3.4 million children are actually affected in the US. And the challenge is, that the speech and language pathologists that, that the schools have is, is, is in relation very small. It's only 60,900 SLPs that are available. So you can see there is a massive scaling problem. There is no way that these pathologists can actually address the needs. First, identify the children with the needs and then come up with solutions you know, which can help them. So our Artificial Intelligence Institute is set up to address this particular challenge. And there is another challenge actually hidden in these numbers, and that is that while the speech and language pathologists are woefully small in number, they are particularly small in areas which need the maximum help because the pathologists sometimes refuse to go to certain areas, rural parts have fewer pathologists and so on. So the areas which actually need the most help get the least help. So we will be looking at both the scaling issue and the equity issue, and this is the challenge that we want to address with artificial intelligence. 
So we are talking essentially about a paradigm shift, bring in artificial intelligence tools to help identify the children who need help, and then come up with the tools to actually help them you know, uh, with whatever disabilities that they have so that they are not left behind. And in order to do so, we came up with a solution which has two parts. The first part is what we call the AI screener, and the second one is the AI orchestrator. So as the name implies, the screener is essentially to identify all the children who will have some disabilities and who will need speech and language help. And then the orchestrator, once having identified those children, how can you provide the tools so that the pathologist can spend the time with the children, with the help of the tools, they are more efficient, and the help being provided is customized so that each children will get the support that they actually need. So these are the two parts, uh, you know, for our institute that we want to develop. So if you talk about an AI screener, we envision a robot, you know, a robot which is probably in a playroom or a classroom, uh, not conspicuous, unobtrusively, somewhere in the corner, and it is essentially observing the children in a group, in their interactions, in their speech, in their gestures, in the way they are communicating, and it is taking notes, right? And then it comes up with, with a report on which children perhaps need additional help. So that is the AI screener. And then uh, the AI screener can also work on a one-on-one -on -one basis, right? So not just in groups. Uh, we envision eventually perhaps this can be taken to homes and parents can use them. And uh, so here in this example, you can see the robot is essentially interacting with the child and saying the baby is sleeping and then asks what is happening here. And based on the child's response, uh, you can determine, you know, what the abilities in speech and language the kid has. And then we, once we have the screener, then we were looking at the orchestrator. And the orchestrator is all about coming up with inter intervention solutions. Uh, so it could be on oral reading fluency, it could be decoding rules, comprehensive tests, and all these, by the way, based on scholarly articles, so it's all evidence-based on exactly what needs to be provided as support. So we'll be looking at what are called, for each child, there is an IEP target, a planned target of what they should accomplish, how many words in a sentence, how many sentences they can put together, can they do the plural by putting the S in the end, uh, how many words with a particular letter. So all different kinds of metrics will be used. So it's evidence-based intervention methods selecting from a whole bunch of stimuli material that is available today and also looking at elicitation techniques in order to provide the intervention. So the idea is that we will implement the AI screener and orchestrator to scale the speech language pathologists. We will adopt, a, sorry, first we'll go this way in the virtuous cycle. We will deploy them and validate our tools then we will also push the frontiers of learning science. So this is not just about artificial intelligence, robotics, and computer science, but also about learning science and you know what advances can be made over there. Look at the foundational AI techniques improvement and that's your virtuous cycle uh, that, that will come into play. I don't want to get into the details of artificial intelligence for this audience today over here. Uh, but we are looking at six different thrust areas. So we will be looking at the core artificial intelligence techniques which can do the generalization based on very few examples. And it is called semi-supervised learning. And we will also be looking at multi-agents because uh, there are multi-agents at play over here. A whole bunch of core comp uh, computational technologies will be put into play. So there are many challenges, you know, we are looking at noisy environments, we are looking at privacy issues, right? The data should not leak out, there is privacy uh, that, that must be guarded all the time. Uh, so we will be looking at all these computer science based challenges and the data itself is multimodal. You know, it could be expressions, voice, face, gestures, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, in, in, as I mentioned, in a multi-agent environment, 
Uh, if you look at the speech recognition accuracy, you know, when it comes to speech of children, the word accuracy rate today is quite poor. So we have done some... So if you look at very early, you know, there is no data available. And uh, for the younger groups, the error rates are very, very high. And we are not going to just look at word uh, error rates. We will look, we'll be looking at other metrics such as speech stalls, repetition, abandoning words, revision of words, mean length of utterances, and so on. So a whole bunch of metrics will be automatically evaluated, both for the screening and the intervention. The vision techniques will work at long distance and low resolution, because you can imagine in a large classroom or a playroom, the cameras are far away. Uh, and we, we are going to make sure that these will be at a cost which will be affordable for all public schools. And also it will be something that can be operated locally. Uh, firstly, for the privacy reasons, that we don't want to put it up in the cloud, you know, where it could be hacked perhaps. And we want the solutions right there, so the solutions can move from classroom to playroom to brought home and so on. So, so that is also something that we are going to ensure. Looking at a whole bunch of different communication modalities. Text enrichment, this is a very interesting area. So now with chat GPT and other interesting, you know, AI generative tools, if you have a passage, let's say it's a kid's book, <coughs> we can use AI techniques to expand a passage. So a long sentence can be made into smaller sentences. Words can be replaced. The grammar structure can be changed while keeping the meaning intact. So such tools can be used to enrich the materials that are being used by children. And it will be a human-centered solution where perhaps we will look at the robot, how should it be designed, on what platform, uh, what ethics uh, you know, rules must be followed, you know, and all those things will be taken into account to come up with our solution. And finally, looking at the learning science frontiers, you know, we are looking at automaticity as a new metric, which is essentially about the fluency of speech. And this is a good metric because it cuts across languages. We often see kids, you know, who, who come from Hispanic background, may not have English as their first language, so they may not perform as well, and that should not be interpreted as a speech impairment. So there are metrics which cut across languages, which we will be, uh, you know, looking at. And we will also do studies on how academic outcomes and language difficulties correlate. That said, I will conclude by saying, you know, our institute is envisioning universal screening available to all children so that no child is left behind. Children will receive ability-based intervention in the elementary schools. Parents and speech language pathologists, teachers and schools can obtain timely and accurate progress reports about their children, and we want to impart confidence in kids to reach their highest potential, have a bright future full of possibilities. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would love to interact with you later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venu. Our next keynote address is from Dr. Luis Claudio Costa. Professor Costa is a highly regarded figure in the field of education, renowned for his outstanding academic contributions and visionary leadership. Presently, he holds two prestigious positions, president of the IREG Observatory in Academic Ranking and Excellence, as well as the esteemed role of academic vice rector at IESB University in Brazil. With an illustrious career, he has previously served as the Minister of Education in the federal government of Brazil and held the distinguished position of rector at the Federal University of Vicosa. Notably, he has also held significant roles, such as President of the National Institute of Educational Studies and Research, 
Anisio Texera, INEP, and Vice President of the PISA Program for International Student Assessment at the OECD. Professor Costa obtained his PhD from Reading University in the United Kingdom, showcasing his exceptional commitment to scholarly pursuits. Through his profound expertise and extensive experience, he continues to make invaluable contributions to the realm of academia in his current role as the Academic Vice Rector of IESB University. I now invite Professor Luis Claudio Costa for the next keynote address. Now it's okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you again uh, to the organizer to invite me to be here. I try to share with you now some of my concerns about uh, AI, about uh, the development of uh, technology. But uh, I must say that uh, I'm sure that AI, and I was very pleased with uh, the former presentation from Dr. Vern is going to help us a lot, and are, it's already doing that. However, we need to look to the poorest people. We have a lot of challenge to do. Let's talk. It's impossible to talk about uh, digital transformation if you don't look the challenge that we have at uh, digital inclusion. We know that we have problems with connectivity, hardware and device, and affordability. Over there, we got some numbers. Only 51.2% of the global population has internet access. In developing countries, 19%. Whereas in uh, developed countries, 87%. So, in Brazil, 40, 40, 40 percent of our uh, schools don't have any computer at all. So, those are what I call the old challenge, but now we have some new challenge. Why? I use the quote from Dr. Peter Diamonds. I don't know if you know him, but he's a very clever guy. He was the founder and first rector of Singularity University. He works a lot with uh, technology. And uh, he has a very nice book. That's the title of his book. The future is faster than you think. Yesterday night, I was discussed with uh, Duncan Ross about the Moore's Law. Moore's Law is not a physical law. It was something that uh, uh, Moore's, Gordon Moore in uh, 1965 said, and until now, it has been true. Is it going to be true in the future? We don't know, but it's working. What uh, did it mean? You can see the computer power here and what happens with our computer. The computer that we have now, the memory that we have in our, in our smartphone is greater the, than the one that was used to the man get to the moon. It seems that's so far away, but that's not. I'm sure that uh, most of us remember here what happens in the past. And now we have it all here. You remember Globuster? We, if you want to see a move, went to rent a tape and take it home. Now we got Netflix. In 2010, Globuster went bankrupt. That's it, it changed very, very, very quick. And now, 
it's happened even faster. What's happened with uh, augmented reality? I used to say that uh, augmented reality is not a novelty for me. I have been used that for more than 30 years, my glass. It helped me a lot. Mixed reality, virtual reality, they are getting together. All of us have heard about metaverse and other things. NFT, blockchain, it happens, it's here. Chat GPT, GPT-4. Look here, that's impressive. The time that Netflix took to reach one million users, 41 months. Facebook, 10 months. Instagram, two and a half months. ChatGPT, in five days. That's it, it's quicker, quicker, and quicker. Faster, faster, and faster. And look who were the big companies in 1960s and uh, what has happened now. If you look back in the 60s, the people that work in General Motors, Ford Motors, ExxonMobil, General Electric, they need to have a kind of skills, completely different. These skills were based on the industrial revolution. There is just one way to do things, right and wrong, right and wrong. Now, we're talking about Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Google. Look what's happening in the world about intangible innovation. You see United States, you see China, India, Brazil, and Korea. We are changed completely the skills that we need to cope with the change. So, in education, if we are talking about digital transformation, we need to ask ourselves, what competences are needed for participating in an increasing tangible economy is completely different than it was in the past. What knowledge, skill, attitudes, and values do you need for, for generating new ideas and products? Big tax firms, how are we going to deal the schools, the higher education, the universities? How are we going to deal with them? What kind of public and private cooperation we need to do? I was uh, vice president of PISA board for during four years. I work a lot with uh, a good friend of mine, Andreas Leischer. She was in, he was in Brazil just uh, a month ago. We discussed a lot about it. Look at this graph. You see the counters here, OECD counters. Uh, on the left side, you will see the people, youngest people, then the oldest people there. You'll see the difference between them. Level two and level three. Level three means that uh, the people are good for digital information. They do have the competence, the skills. Level two, they are not. It's the same for the young people. I will give you a summary of this, see? Young adults and older adults. I'll give you a summary of what is in there. If you look at the older generation, United States is the only G20 country that has one in five adults able to solve uh, digital problem solving skills that's needed in today's economy. 
Okay, but how about the young people? Again, the news are not so good. You see, just a half, 50% of the young people moving the labor market are reasonable fit for the digital work. And if you look at the poorest people, it's still worse. Singapore was to be on the last, but now it's getting very well with Finland and Sweden. Well, we have been discussed a lot today about the road, about uh, artificial intelligence AI, and uh, what concerns me is, unfortunately, we got the real world here, we got AI, look at our world and help us to make it better. But when we went to some schools and universities, that's the small world of curriculum. That's terrible. What are we doing with our students? We need to show them the human world of knowledge, including AI. But we got art, we got music, we got computer, we got dance. We are not supposed to put them in the box. So, we need to ensure that our students, regardless of their socioeconomic background or geographical location, have access to the same educational resources. Remember, we are talking about the new skills that are needed. So digital literacy is very important for success. Digital inclusion helps bridge the knowledge gap between different regions and population and prepare students for the increasing digital and technology future. We know that uh, technology has always destroyed a lot of jobs, but created a lot of new jobs. However, with the speed of technology de development in our days, we will be able to give all the students, all the students, include the poorest, and the population in general in a short period of time? That's the main question. That's the new challenge. We don't have a lot of time anymore. We did to have it. We don't have the skills that they need for the future jobs, or will it widen the gap between rich and poor? We'll let them outside. We need to do something very quickly. Otherwise, we are going to lose, by far, the race to technology. We need to act fast. We need to, I like, form follows function. It means that uh, you cannot use the same for if the function is different. What is the function of uh, the university today? What's the function of schools today? So we cannot have the same form of management and teaching. We need to change. We need to think. We need to use AI to help us to improve and to help the poor people to get into the market because I don't believe, it's not because I believe, because it, it worked for me. I was the first one in my family to get to university in Brazil. Unfortunately, edu higher education in Brazil is so young. The oldest universe higher university in Brazil has no more than 100 years. I was a secretary of higher education in Brazil 2011. 
And I fought a lot to have an affirmative action for black people, because black people were completely out at that time from Brazilian University. And thanks to this law, now 50% of our place, all place in a high, public higher education in Brazil should be for black and poor people. That was something that we fight in the past. But now there is another one that we must do. No children, no young people can be left behind the technology. And we need to act faster, not only in Brazil, but everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Costa. Our next performance will be a musical celebration of C20, You Are the Light, Be Happy, sorry, Be Love, Be Happy, by Andrea Dabrowski from Germany and Hugo Tigiotti from the UK. Om Amiti Shwaye Namaha To move forward, every living being in life needs love. May Amma bless us so that the precious honeybees can resides in our hearts. Om, salutations to you, dear honeybee. Even as a tiny pollinator, you are as significant as our sun to sustain humanity and Mother Earth. Om, dear honeybee, 35% of the world's food crops depend on your life-giving efforts. Om, divine miracle honeybee, through God's power, 
11,000 times your little wings beat in a single minute. To produce one kilogram of honey, one hive flies the equivalent of three times around the world. Om, greatest queen bee, you are the mother of all bees and you are the glue that keeps the colony in your hive together. cosmic dance. Also deaf, you communicate through dance with your six legs. Your dance is called waggle dance. Um, dear honeybee, you recognize your beekeepers and lovingly carries their faces tenderly with your soft and furry body. Oh, dear bee lovers, you can save a honeybee lying on the floor by offering some drops of sugar water near its tiny mouth so it can fly again. Albert Einstein stated that if the honeybees disappear from earth, humanity will perish within four years. pesticides, build cities, the more we lose our wild spaces and meadows for the honeybee to find flowers and food. Um, dear honeybee, the Divine Mother, Mata Amritananda Mahi states, be like the honeybee who gathers only nectar wherever it goes. Seek the goodness that is found in everyone. Om, dear honeybee, you are divine flying jewels, keeping humanity alive. Om, dear honeybee, let us fill our hearts with the nectar of love for you as much as we fill our plates with delicious food as cherries, berries, broccoli, almonds from you. Um, dear humans, let us make a firm resolve in our hearts. I will plant flowery trees. I will nurture bees for the benefit of humanity and Mother Earth. I will install beehives. Oh, everyone, young and old, be the change for our bees. We love you.
Suzuki no Bavantu Loka Samasta Suzuki no Bavantu Be love, be happy. Thank you, Andrea and Hugo. We'll now start making our way into the panel discussions, which are in.